See you. 
Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I don't know more of you. I'm desperate for your presence, longing to be with you. Lead me to a new place. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you would lead us every day in that closer relationship that we would have with you. Father, our desire, Lord, is to, to be with you. Our desire, Lord, is to get closer to you. And I just pray, Father, uh, today for each and every person that is here. I pray for each and every person that is logged in somewhere around the world that is listening and, and hearing your word go forth. I pray that the Spirit of God would move. Lord, today may be a different type of uh, uh, message in terms of how it's presented, but Lord, your word is never changing. And the methods may be different, but the message never changes. And we just thank you, Lord, that as we are starting this week out, as it's a, a holy week and it's Easter week, Lord, and as it's Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus triumphantly came into Jerusalem and everybody was waving the palm branches and singing Hosanna, hallelujah. And the same people the following week were yelling crucify him. I pray, Lord, our hearts would not be like that. That when we come to church, we would be in praise. And when we're out there during the week, we forget about your goodness, about your grace, about your mercy, about your love, about your forgiveness. We just thank you, God. I thank you for this family that you've brought together. We thank you, Lord, for the visitors. We thank you, Lord, Father, for those that, that have come, Lord, to hear a word from heaven. And I just pray that today that your word would touch and pierce hearts, change hearts, change lives, not for just today, but forever. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. We love you. You know, you know what? Turn around and say hi to someone as you're having a seat. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of God. We want to welcome all of you that are watching online. We're so glad that you're with us. Well, we're so glad to see you this morning here at the Rock Church. Uh, 
And today is a uh, it's a special day. It's a it's a different type of service. You know the 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 gospel is presented in many ways. It doesn't just have to be the preacher preaching, but it could be presented in many different ways. And today we've put together what we call the Last Supper narrative. It's a narrative of Jesus when he is at that moment of of having his last supper with his disciples. He spent three years with these men, and he's imparted into them. He gave his life for these three men. And at the Passover, uh, just before uh, he was about to go to his death, his last moments with his disciples before they fled and disappeared and uh, uh, stranded and abandoned him, he says these words, Assuredly I say to you that, One of you will betray me. Could you imagine being a person that was following Jesus and him say, tonight you're going to betray me. And and in your heart you're saying, how can that be? And in in, in the picture of the Last Supper, you see the different poses. You see the people looking, how they're looking in the different poses. Leonardo da Vinci, as he painted that famous painting, he wanted to capture that famous moment when Jesus says, tonight, when are you betraying me? And that's what that picture is all about. For those of you who do not know, he wanted to uh, portray as he imagined that night was that everybody turned around when they heard that. And the Bible tells us in the Gospels that, that each of the disciples, not just one, but each of them began to say to the Lord, is it I? They started to question themselves and wondering. So today as we get into the narrative of the Last Supper, I want you to listen carefully because not only we're hearing the Word of God, but we're going to, it's, it's a really a history lesson about what took place because everything that's said, it's a reminder of what was portrayed in the gospel as these disciples lived out their life with Jesus. So in a moment, we are going to enter in, but first of all, we are going to uh, tell you a story about the painting and how the painting had come to pass. So I want all of you to thank you very much. I hope all of you enjoy it. This is the narrative of the Last Supper. This is a strange but true story about the Last Supper. The Last Supper was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, a noted Italian artist, and the time engaged for its completion was seven years. The figures representing the 12 apostles and Christ himself were painted from living persons. The life model for the painting of the figure of Jesus was chosen first. When it was decided that da Vinci would paint this great picture, hundreds and hundreds of young men were carefully viewed in an endeavor to find a face and personality exhibiting innocence and beauty, free from the scars and signs of dissipation caused by sin. Finally, after weeks of laborious searching, a young man 19 years of age was selected as a model of the portrayal of Christ. For six months, Da Vinci worked on the production of this leading character of his famous painting. During the next six years, Da Vinci continued his labors on this sublime work of art. One by one, fitting persons were chosen to represent each of the 11 apostles. Space being left for the painting of the figure representing Judas Iscariot as the final task of this masterpiece. This was the apostle, you remember, who betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver, worth in our present day currency of $16.96. For weeks, da Vinci searched for a man with a hard, callous face, with a countenance marked by scars, avarice, deceit, hypocrisy, and crime, a face that would delineate a character who would betray his best friend. After many discouraging experiences in searching for the type of person required to represent Judas, word came to da Vinci that a man whose appearance fully met his requirements had been found in a dungeon in Rome, sentenced to die for a life of crime and murder. 
Da Vinci made the trip to Rome at once, and this man was brought out from his imprisonment in the dungeon and led out into the light of the sun. There, Da Vinci saw before him a dark, swarthy man. His long, shaggy, and unkempt hair sprawled over his face, which portrayed a character of viciousness and complete ruin. At last, the famous painter had found the person he wanted to represent the character of Judas in his painting. By special permission from the king, this prisoner was carried to Milan, where the picture was being painted, and for months he sat before da Vinci at appointed hours each day as the gifted artist diligently continued his task of transmitting to this painting this base character in the picture, representing the traitor and betrayer of our savior. As he finished his last stroke, he turned to the guards and said, I have finished. You may take the prisoner away. As the guards were leading their prisoner away, he suddenly broke loose from their control and rushed up to Da Vinci, crying as he did so. Oh, Da Vinci, look at me. Do you not know who I am? Da Vinci, with the trained eyes of a great character student, carefully scrutinized the man upon whose face he had constantly gazed at for six months and replied, no. I have never seen you in my life until you were brought, brought out to me of the dungeon in Rome. Then, lifting his eyes toward heaven, the prisoner said, O oh God, have I fallen so low? Then, turning his face to the painter, he cried, Leonardo da Vinci, look at me again, for I am the same man you painted just seven years ago as the figure of Christ. This story of the Last Supper teaches so strongly the effects of right or wrong thinking on the life of an individual. Here, the portrayal of a young man whose character, unspoiled by the sins of the world, was so pure that he presented a countenance of innocence and beauty, fit to be used for painting of a representation of Christ. But within seven years following the thoughts of sin and a life of crime, his countenance was changed into a picture of the most traitorous character ever known in the history of the world. You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar amongst the people. Agreed? Agreed. Judas. What are you willing to give me? Verily, verily. I say unto you that tonight one of you shall betray me. I am Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. I was the first to bring someone to the Lord when I brought my brother Peter to Jesus. I also found the little boy with the five loaves and two fishes that day when Jesus fed the 5,000. As I watched him feed so many with so little, I was so glad that I decided to serve the Lord by just being myself. He must have seen something of value in me, which the others overlooked, because he selected me to be one of the twelve apostles. We have shared much triumph and many tragedies. I may not have been in the inner circle like Peter, but I've been a friend and a companion to my Lord. What greater gift could life afford a fisherman? Now one of us is to betray him? It is
is unthinkable. Who could it be? How could he get away with it in his own heart? Could it be me, Andrew? Could it, could it be me? I am James, the brother of John. I followed Jesus with my brother after he called us while we were mending our nets by the Sea of Galilee. I was with Jesus in the home of Jairus when he raised his little daughter from the sleep of death. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Last week, we asked him, Teacher, grant us to sit one at your right hand and the other at your left when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? We said, Lord, we are able. Jesus then reminded us that he who would be first must be the servant of all. And then he demonstrated his words by washing our feet just before supper. He taught us that God's way was always one of love. And now, the one who taught us the way of love is to be betrayed by one of those whom he loved. Why should one of us do such a thing? I keep thinking deep down inside my own heart. Is it I? Lord, is it I? I am Matthew, and I was a tax collector at the gates of Jerusalem. When Jesus came to me and said, follow me, I had mixed emotions because I was a very important man, and to follow Jesus meant losing all my prestige and worldly possessions. I knew that nothing would ever be the same again if I followed Jesus, but my heart longed for something that only he could fill. When Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, all the confusion and unrest left my soul. <laughs> then I knew Jesus was to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I am Philip. I came from Bethsaida in Galilee. While several of my friends and I were in Bethany, listening to John the Baptist, Jesus called us to become his disciples. Over the years I've spent with Jesus, my faith in God has become stronger and deeper. I remember so well before he fed the five thousands with five loaves and two fish, asking him and others, where are we to buy bread that all these may eat? Little did I know that Andrew was already bringing a young boy and his lunch to Jesus. When Jesus began to tell us that God was our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. However, as I have listened to the Master, I have grown to understand His words. In fact, I can almost say that he who's seen Jesus has seen the Father. But it is shocking to hear that there is a betrayer in our midst. Does the traitor not know that in betraying Jesus, he is also betraying God? Who is it? Can it be me, Philip? Lord, is it I? Is it I? I am Thomas. Many people think of me as a doubter. Deep down, I'm not. But it's because I usually demand proof before I believe. I recall the day when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that their brother, Lazarus, was dead. Jesus turned to us and said, let's go to him. We knew of the growing opposition to Jesus, and some of the apostles didn't want to go into Bethany. I spoke out saying, let us also go with him, that we may die with him. Why do people remember my fear and forget my faith? Now I could almost see Jesus as rebuking the winds on the stormy Galilee and healing the sick, curing the disease and opening the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, cleansing the lepers and preaching the gospel to the poor. But opposition has developed. His enemies are determined to destroy him, 
Why? Because the God he reveals is a greater God than in the petty little man-made deities. And now, he says that even among us, the chosen 12, there's a traitor? Is he speaking of me? Is it? Is it me? I am John. Jesus called me to follow him when I was mending fishing nets with my father Seventy and my brother James. What a wonderful change in my life since I met Jesus. He taught me that love is the key to life. And that's so true. For it was love, God's wonderful love, that caused me to follow Jesus. And now, after that love has touched my life, I suddenly realize that Jesus came to live and die. That I, John, might have eternal life. Oh, but how it hurts to hear Jesus say, one of us would betray that love. Oh, Lord, I wonder if it's me. Is it? Is it me? I am James. People call me James the Less. I will never forget the first time I saw Jesus near the place where John was baptizing. I was curious, so I went over for a closer look. Jesus was in the water asking John to baptize him. After John had baptized the Lord, the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And we heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son and who I am well pleased. From that moment Jesus called me, I have devoted myself to follow him. And now, one of us is to betray him? Surely it's madness to think that one of us would betray him. Surely the betrayer is out of his mind. But I keep asking myself, could it? Could it be me? I am Thaddeus. Jesus chose the 12 of us to become the cornerstones of the new kingdom, just as the 12 tribes of Israel were the cornerstones of the old Jewish kingdom. I remember that after a night in prayer, Jesus called us to him and gave us authority over unclean spirits and then commissioned us to go forth and preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I was in Jerusalem when he gave that great invitation. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now he who came to share men's burdens has a burden thrown upon him. The knowledge that one of us will betray him. Which one of us can it be? Who is the traitor? The man we least suspect? Or will all of us betray him before the night is over? Philip, Peter, Judas, John, or even me, Thaddeus? Is it I? Lord, is it I? I am Nathaniel. Like many of the others, I am a fisherman. I was a disciple of John the Baptist. But it was my friend Philip who came to me and said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I said it not in scorn. But the town was such a little insignificant place that I wondered why God placed his anointed in her midst. However, Philip simply replied, Come and see. When I saw Jesus, he said, Behold! an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? I asked. He answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus was actually telling me that he had known me since the day I was born. That's all I needed. I believed. You know, I find it so hard to believe that one of us will betray the anointed one of God. Could it be me? Is it me?
I am Simon, the zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to the group of hot-headed revolutionaries known as the zealots. We were all for armed rebellion against Rome and the reestablishment of King David's kingdom of Israel. But now, Jesus told us of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns supremely. Since I heard him, he has shown me that the conquest of the heart is the only true, sincere, and lasting conquest. I have unconditionally and completely surrendered myself to him. This surrender has not imprisoned me, rather it, for the first time in my life, has set me free. I am not afraid of Rome any longer. Rome is mighty, but God is almighty. Now Jesus says that there is a spiritual Roman among us, one who would attempt by force what can only be conquered by love. So who can it be? Matthew, the tax collector? The big fisherman or his brother? Or does he suspect me? Since I am the only former zealot among us, could it be me? Could it? All the others came from Galilee. My home is in the village of Kerioth, in Judea. Hence I am known as Judas, Judas Iscariot. The others must have confidence in me because they elected me their treasurer. Despite what others say behind my back about my impatience, my stinginess, my ambition. Jesus believes in me. If he hadn't, he would have chosen someone in my place. Some say that I've appropriated these funds for my own use and that Jesus' words about the love of money were personally directed at me. Others keep reminding me that Jesus was referring to me when he said, did I choose you 12 and one of you is a devil? Certainly I complained when Mary washed his feet with that expensive ointment and perfume. I still think it was a waste of money. And if I conspired with the chief priests, and if I have 30 pieces of silver on my person, that's my affair. I believe in Jesus. Oh, yes. I believe in Jesus. But someone has to force the issue. Make him assert himself as God's Messiah. He refuses to make a move. Well, I've made one. And what would you do if you were in my place and wanted him to do something dramatic and startling to usher in his kingdom? What would you do? Should I ignore his remark? Or like the other, should I ask myself, is it me? Is it me? I'm Peter, the fisherman. The master said that one of us would betray him. Was he referring to me when he said that? 
If I knew the scoundrel was, I'd pierce his heart and cut off his tongue. Maybe it'd be my own heart that I would pierce. God, grant it not be so. Yet, I keep thinking to myself, could it, could it be me? Lord, is it? He who dips his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Judas, what you must do, do it quickly. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are all my disciples. And even now, I must go and leave you. Lord, where? Where are you going? Where I go, you cannot follow now, Peter. But you shall follow me later. Why, Lord? Why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Peter, will you lay down your life for me? Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail you. And when you turn again, please strengthen all of your brothers. Lord, with you I'm willing to go both prison and death. Truly I say to you that this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you shall deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be full of fear. If you believe in God, believe also in me. If you only knew how my heart has longed to eat this Passover with you. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors on the staff, and I get the honor of, of taking a moment right now and just sharing <clears throat> communion with you, the idea of what's behind it. And I want to say this to you right up front. There's, I don't think there's any other greater opportunity that we have to enter into a fellowship with God and with each other as there is a time like right now to take communion. Let's look at the Word of God. And when the hour came, he took his place at the table with the apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. It's really interesting today as I look at this and we examine this because Jesus is, he says, that I, I so eagerly want to take this Passover with you. It's interesting that this Passover meal, Jesus now is in the process of converting it to the communion meal. He takes it, he takes all the Old Testament tradition of, of, of Passover where there was four cups and each of the cups in that tradition were reflective of redemption. They talked about being freed from, from slavery, from bondage, and crossing over through the Red Sea and coming and being accepted into the promised land that God had given to them. And all these forms of redemption, Jesus now brings together at this table and he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And in doing so, he's saying to us today, your sins are forgiven, you're released, you're free. You're, and, and by partaking and by, by receiving this today, you're joining yourself to me. Let me say this to you today. Communion is not just symbolic, even though it is very much that. There's something spiritual that happens today. There's something spiritual that's going to happen in your life. 
And I'm telling you this right now so that you will begin to expect something. Expect that the Spirit of God is going to move. Let me say this to you. That when you're hungry physically and you're drained and you can't go any further, a little bit of food will do you good. A little bit of nourishment will strengthen your body. And as you eat food and the proteins and all the elements that are good inside food, strengthen your muscles, give you energy. And can I say to you today that Jesus commands us as believers to partake. This do in remembrance of me. And can I say this to you? It's not just a ritual. It's a conversion that we take of being spiritual and not just going through the motions, not just eating some little piece of wafer or, or, or drinking some type of juice because to us today, we bought the juice. It's not his blood. We, we bought the wafers. They're, they're, not, they're not something that fell off his skin. But by eating them, by drinking them, we receive all the redemption, all the goodness. Today, if you're in this room today, you're not born again. Can I say to you today, just in your proclamation of faith, you can today be saved, be born again, be redeemed. But perhaps you're in this room today, this very day, and you're not feeling well, can I say to you today that in this same meal, by taking, by ingesting, by taking in, you are physically doing something that has spiritual transformation to it. Jesus is saying, if you do this in faith, if you believe in me, if you remember what I've done for you, then you're letting me transform you. Today, you might have an ought. The Bible talks about having an ought against someone, having having a disagreement or, or a family member or a friend or somebody that you know that maybe you've come into conflict with, then, then why not resolve that today? Let me say this to you. We, take, we partake of communion as individuals, but we also partake of communion as a family. If you think this strange, even today's illustration, each of the people did what? They did this. They examined their own hearts. Is it me? Could it, could it be? Have I, have I offended? Could I have done something wrong? And so today, as you partake of communion, it's time to examine. In, in, the, in the Corinthians, Paul chastises them for approaching the table the wrong way. Some of them left drunk. Some of them left hungry. And, and the condition of their heart was not right. They weren't taking communion the correct way. And today, you have that opportunity to say, I, I, I need to examine my own life. Is my faithfulness to God reflective in my relationships? Is it reflective in my health? Is it reflective in the way I think and what I do? See, this is a great opportunity for us to come together. Now, I'm, I'm a little bit backwards, and I forgot to tell you that there's more to this story coming. But I want to give you some instructions because in the house, we like to have some order. Is that okay? So as you prepare your heart, I'm going to ask everybody in the mid midsection this way and all this section to come down this aisle and partake in this table. And the same thing from this side over and over here to come and pick up the elements and come to the side. I'm inviting you. If you come alone, that's great. If you come with a, a husband, a wife, a, a family, or, or someone else, then take the communion elements and slip off to the side for a moment and take a moment to say, Lord, I, I, I remember and I, I allow you now as I partake to transform my life. Listen, God is not done with you. Somebody say amen. And he wants to do greater things in you. And I want you to know something today. You can't do it alone. You need the spirit of God. You need what was happening in this time of remembering and being nourished once again. I want you to know uh, that as you come forward, you will know when to come because we're going to be playing another video, some music. And during that time, we're going to invite you to come forward and partake and then go back down the sides on each of the outer aisles and return to your seat because we have a, an additional video. I want you to know this. The additional video has to do with the results of the apostles. And let me tell you something today. I believe with all my heart, 
you've got some good results. You've got a great end coming because Jesus has already prepared a place for you and I. So let's watch, walk, 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 watch, and let's partake of communion together as a church family. Let me, can I pray over you real quickly? Because I, I just want to pray over the bread and over the wine. Father, we bow our hearts and minds to you today. We ask God that as, as the bread is broken, we ask God that you would reveal yourself to our hearts. If we have need of healing, then heal us. If we have need of salvation, then save us. If we, if we have need of, of confession, Lord, or, Lord, or clearing up in our hearts, Lord, that we're not perfect, I pray, Father, that in the breaking, in the eating, in the drinking, Lord, that you might reveal yourself to us, that you might strengthen us as we remember everything that you've accomplished in our redemption. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.
John was in exile at the Isle of Patmos after escaping without injury from a pot of boiling oil. He was later returned and died at a great age. Peter, along with many other saints, Nero sought to have him put to death. Jerome tells us that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward as he himself requested because he said, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as our Lord. His wife also suffered martyrdom. Andrew, he was crucified at Odessa on a cross shaped like the letter X with two ends put deep into the ground. This was called the St. Andrew's Cross. James the Elder, he was put to death by Herod Agrippa. As James was led away to the place of martyrdom, his accuser was brought to report of his conduct, of the apostle's extraordinary courage, and he fell down on his knees to request pardon, confessing himself to be a Christian and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Philip suffered martyrdom in Parga. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Nathaniel. He was cruelly beaten and crucified upside down. Thomas excited the rage of the pagan priest while he was preaching, and he was martyred, being thrust through with a spear. Matthew. He was martyred at Ethiopia being slain with a pickaxe, a long handled iron weapon with a pick on one side and an axe on the other. James the Less was beaten, stoned and had his brains bashed out with a folder's club, a tool or a hammer that was used for grooving and spreading iron. Thaddeus, he was crucified at Odessa. Simon, he was crucified at Judea. Judas Iscariot. Then Judas, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, laid down His life through sacrifice on Calvary. The perfect Lamb of God, who knew no sin, yet took upon Himself all the sin of all mankind through all generations that we might be redeemed. Oh, the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Oh, the price that was paid for by others to preserve the gospel and bring it down to us that we might believe and be saved.
guys are so cute, just clapping and clapping and clapping, saying, should I keep on clapping? Is it going to end? I'm going to clap longer. <laughs> and you guys are amazing. Wasn't that good? It was just, you know, I just love to be, to be able to present the gospel in different ways. You know, today is, is uh, it's just amazing because this time of year, and for believers, it's, it's an everyday thing. But it's one of those times of forgiveness. It's, it's a time that God came down to forgive us for our screw-ups. And in life, we need to go on and continue to go on. And You know, at times it, it hurts. It's hard. It's difficult. But Jesus went before us. He paved the way. He made a way for us. Today, as we uh, continue, we're going to be dismissing here in a little bit, but... What we're going to do is we're going to just give back to God with our tithes and offerings. Amen. I'm going to, if you need an envelope, the ushers will help you and give an envelope to you this day. I'm going to share something with you um, that might help you to understand about tithes and offering and about the tithe. There's a story in the Bible in 2 Kings in the fourth chapter, and it's about Elisha the prophet. The Bible says that he went to a, a town called Shunem, and there was a, a, a lady there, a notable woman, and she was known as the Shunammite woman in the Bible. The Bible says that whenever Elisha would come, the prophet, that they would feed him, and they would take him in and, and give him food. You know, back in those days in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets were like the church. They were like a traveling church. They were like, would bring the word of God. They said, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. And so whenever that, whenever the prophet would come to town, when they would take care of him, what they're saying is we're welcoming God to our place. She said to her husband, you know what? The, the prophet comes on a regular basis. Let's just not allow him and give him a meal when he's in town. That's good. But let's take care of the man of God. Let's take care of the prophet. Let's take care of the, the place that we get nourishment from, the word. So, the, so she says to her husband, let's make him a, a, a room that whenever he's in town, he could come and stay. And let's make a bed and put a bed a, and a table and a chair and a lampstand. Let's just make a place that he is comfortable. You know what? The church is like that. We've allowed uh, 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 God to come into this place. We, we've opened up a place where we put chairs and we, we've made a, a lobby and we have a place for kids and we have a place where people could come and, and receive the word of God. And we do it because we love God, because we don't want just to ha allow God just to come and pass by and just throw him our, our seconds and just, oh, whatever. But we've made a place, just like the Shunammite woman and her husband made a place. Now, God honors your giving. God loves a cheerful giver whose heart is in his giving. God won't abandon a cheerful giver. And it's, it's fascinating because the story continues on, and it kind of helps us to understand about next week with our miracle offering. And also with our giving as we give of our tithes and offerings. See, next weekend, for those of you who don't know, we have a, every year we do what was called a miracle offering. We give over and above our tithes and offerings a special gift to the house of God to allow us to continue on. We, there's some special things. We're, we're um, going to be getting a water, a portable water baptism. And, and in the month, of, uh, the month of April at the end, we're going to be uh, doing baptisms right outside whether we're not sure if it's going to be in the lobby or outside so those of you who haven't been baptized you get to be baptized it's going to be amazing here in the house instead of going to a instead of going to a jacuzzi or someone's pool or whatever but but in that in the miracle offering we're believing that as you bring it you come with a with what you're believing for in a miracle when you bring your tithes and offerings we you know an offering and a, and a tithe is a seed it's a seed that you plant in the ground. When you are believing for watermelons, you plant watermelon seeds. When you're believing for an apple tree, you plant apples. When you're believing for corn, you, you, you're specific saying, I want a corn crop or I want an apple orchard. I want, you know, you're specific. 
And I love what happens because the prophet here, excuse me, the prophet comes along and he says to his assistant, what is it that this Shunammite woman, because of her generosity for for us, for, because of the generosity for the man of God, what, what can we do for her? And she says, you know what? Everything's fine. I, I don't really need anything. Basically, you know what Elisha was saying? He's saying, I want you to name your seed. Your seed was you gave us a bed. You gave us a table. You gave us a chair. You gave us a lampstand. You know, we, we want you to be specific about that, sowing that seed. And I think sometimes in life, we just give to God and say, oh, it's, it's nothing. When in all reality, God says, you know what? You're sowing a seed. And the, the law of God is what you sow is what you reap. If you sow goodness in the life of someone, you're going to reap goodness. If you sow finances, you're going to reap maybe in, in a different area. But what is the need? And I think sometimes when we come to church, we just give. But I think sometimes we need to come uh, and, and be specific. And I, a lot of you probably don't realize it, but when we do our offering confession, you know, there might be a need, bills paid off. Checks in the mail. I received a check in the mail. I was so excited because I was, I, I was, it was an unexpected check, but it was a check in the mail, and it, it was, it, it was, I was excited to get it. You know, uh, um, um, uh, what else is on the, some of the, some of the things? Uh, bills decreased. Gifts and surprises. Witty inventions. And what we're doing is we're being specific when we give. And so the prophet says, what do you want? She says, I don't need, really need anything. And he says, and he gave the specific seed a name. And he says, by this time next year, you will have a child. You see, Elisha's assistant said, this woman can't have children. Her and her husband, they're getting older. They've tried. And God knows the desires of your heart. And so he knew, and he says, I'm going to speak that seed, that name, because of the seed that you've sowed in our lives, I'm going to speak it forth. By this time next year, you will have a child. And she says, please don't tease me. And he says, no, it will happen. And the Bible says that it happened. So today, as we give of our tithes and offerings, what is it that you're believing God for? Are you believing God for a restoration of a family member? Are you, are you believing for a healing in your body? Are you believing for a job? Are you believing for bills to be paid off? Are you, what are you believing? And I pray that as you come, and when you come to the house of God, as you're sowing your seed, you're allowing us to have the chairs and have the tables and have a place where people could come into the house of God. God is saying to you, I want you to be specific with that seed. What are you believing for this day. What are you believing for for God? And when you come next week also with your miracle offering, come believing. Pray about it as a family. Get together and say, we are coming together as a family and we're believing as we sow this extra seed. God gave his best on Easter for us. And that's why we do our miracle offerings because we're giving our best. And a little uh, over our tithes and offerings saying, God, you gave your best so we're going to give. And this is a seed that we're sowing in the ground and we're believing God for. What is it that you're believing God for? So I want all of you to know that we love you and we thank you. But I think sometimes instead of just giving, let's be specific and believe God. Because why get a, a, a bag of seeds and sow it in the ground and say, oh, what, whatever comes up, whatever will happen? No. Let's be specific. And I love how the Word of God shows us and reveals that to us when the prophet spoke to the Shunammite woman and says, no, I know the desires of heart. God says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you, have, if you already got an envelope, just fill that out all the way. If you're writing out a check, write it out to the Rock Church. And as you're filling that out, we just have a, 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 a couple of announcements, and then we're going to make our confession unto the Lord as we plant that seed into the kingdom of God. Uh, Friday, we have a uh, uh, Good Friday communion service. It's going to be good. We're going to partake of communion, but we're going to do it in a different way, in a different manner. But it's just going to be great as we, as we celebrate because in all reality, Palm Sunday is when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and they were worshiping. There's that old man, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were praising him. And Good Friday was the, the Friday that he had that, the Last Supper, and then he was ready to, 
go the last few days into what was the worst days of his life here on the earth, but yet Easter Sunday was the greatest day for humanity. So come on on um, Good Friday and, and then also on Easter Sunday. This year we're believing for, uh, for two things as we are in that miracle offering and the Chris, and Christmas Easter season is that we are going to be a bringer. We're going to bring someone to allow them to uh, allow God to touch them. And also we're going to be givers also. Are you ready? Lord, this day? No, 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 no. That's not good enough. All right, come. Are you guys ready to give them to the Lord today? Let's, let's be cheerful givers. Ready? One, two, three. Father God, today I come into your house, bring you my tithes and offerings according to Malachi 3.10. Thank you for rebuking the devourer on my behalf. Because I'm a faithful and consistent giver, I'm not limited to the world's economy. You have blessed me to be a blessing. I speak your word over my finances, and I believe in God for jobs or better jobs, raises and bonuses, bills paid off, unexpected income, inheritances, bills decreased, blessing and increase, favor with God and man, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, generosity, increased capacity, witty inventions, and creative ideas. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting all my financial needs, that I have my more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Woo! As they're passing out the buckets, I also want to say a big thank you. You saw the credits of those that were the voices of the apostles and disciples, but also we have Jackson right here, Jackson Dean. He came up and gave the narrative as we started off today. Doesn't he do a great job? Just, it's just amazing. And uh, what else? Oh, you know what? As you probably noticed, Pastor Donna wasn't here at the beginning of service. There was an owl, an owl, a hoo-hoo, that was out by our box truck out there, the truck that picks up the groceries, and it, was, uh, it wasn't flying away. It was hurt. So my wife, the rescuer, not only does she rescue souls and save souls and uh, leads people to Jesus, but she was out there, and they took, and Ernie and, and like Marion took, went with you. They, they went and they, I don't, they threw the, the blanket over because they called the, um, the living desert. What do we do? And they said, well, this is what you do. And they, okay. And I know, I hear that owls are pretty crazy, you know, went to, especially if you're hurt. Big, big talons, claws or whatever. So anyway, she, they, they went and they threw the, the blanket and they, I guess you guys wrapped it up. Is that what happened? You want to come? Yeah, come and share. Come tell us a story. I want to hear. I, I'm just getting this second hand. It's not tell us a story. But anyway, that they were rescuing. We don't only see souls saved, but we also rescue animals. Okay, children, let Nana tell you a story. No. <laughs> well, it was this morning. Actually, Jaime had seen it. It was an injured, it's an injured great white owl. So we called the Living Desert and said, what do we do? Can you send somebody? And they said, we don't send anybody, but you can bring it to us. We're like, you're right. So I said, well, let us know what to do then. So anyway, Ernie went out, and actually Ernie was the one that caught it. I just went with the blanket on the other side and kind of shoot it to Ernie's arms. But um, then we put it in, in a, a little bin and made sure that it could breathe and drove it up to the living desert, and they, um, they took it for us. They're going to rescue it. And technically, we have donated a great horned owl to the living desert, so they'll let us know how it's doing, and they think that it may be a mom. So they asked us to look up in our palm trees to see if there's any nests and to watch for any lost babies. So, um, but that's what happened. So like Pastor already said, we rescue souls, but we also rescue animals. So um, that was my journey today. Thank you. <laughs> Tell them I want a plaque, says the Rock Church donated this out. No, anyway. Um, I think that's it. I, I don't want to forget anything. I know if, you know what, if you... Oh, auditions today, if you're a musician, stay, uh, come at 1.30, and uh, there's going to be auditions for uh, musicians. We would love, if you're uh, a musician, play an instrument, come and be a part of that. We need more musicians. And then also, if you gave your life to the Lord today, 
you say, well, I didn't really do any. You know, if you came forward and you said, Lord, forgive me. I, 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 I'm coming back to you. I'm coming home to you, Jesus. I want to be born again. After, when we dismiss, just head out that door. And Pastor David and Al will be at that back door to give you some free information and to help you out. And then the world's largest Easter basket, I'm telling you, over $1,000 worth of stuff, good stuff, um, is out there. So the next week after the second service, we'll be announcing you don't have to be here to win, but it'd be nice to take that away and receive everything. So I want all of you to stand to your feet. We're so glad. Thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you for being a part of, uh, of our wonderful presentation of the Last Supper narrative. Remember Wednesday night, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have an awesome time. I'm believing that this is going to be off on Friday. Oh, I forgot. You know what? I forgot who's here for the very first time. We want to welcome you. Just slip up your hands. Oh, God. Keep them up because our ushers. Ushers, sorry about that, guys. I threw you off. Oh, hold on a sec. We have something right here. We at the Rock Church here in Coachella Valley like to mug people. So we're going to put a, a little card in your hand, one per family. We're going to give you a coffee mug from us to you. And we want to let you know that you can tell your friends, I went to church and I got mugged. And uh, you're going to say, I liked it. Now, we came from the church in San Bernardino. Now, you couldn't say that out there because they'd probably really mug you because it's a tough and a rough area. So, but here, because we're so nice and friendly and so sweet in the Coachella Valley, we're going to mug you. So let me pray a blessing over you. Father, we just thank you for today. I thank you for this awesome time of the word being presented. Father God, in a different way. I thank you, Lord, Father God, that it entered the heart of each and every person. Father, as we prepare this week to be ministered by you, Lord, help us to realize and see when there's someone that's hurting or someone that's broken, that we might be a person that would invite, that would bring that would give an invitation for them to come to church. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, as a church that we don't just come and gather together just for us, but, Lord, we've called, uh, called out to do what you've called us to do, and that's to love people to life. God bless you.